This is Oliver here at Simple Labour Tube. I'm joined today by Anthony Barnett, uh, his new book, The Lure of Greatness. Uh, he's here to talk about it today with us. So just firstly, how would you, how would you sum up uh, The Lure of Greatness uh, just briefly? Well, briefly, I, I think I'd sum it up by saying, why did I come to write it? And I wrote a book called Blimey, It Could Be Brexit, sort of chapter by chapter, week by week, during the referendum, because I didn't think it would happen, but I thought it could happen. And that alone, I felt, really needed attention. How is it possible um, that, that Brexit might come about, despite everybody's expectations? And then it did happen, and, uh, and then Trump also followed. And so I, I set about trying to drill down a bit deeper. So it seems to me that, that and it's becoming clearer now that this is the case, that Brexit is quite a profound breakdown of traditional British government, just as Trump is a breakdown in the way America has governed itself and seen itself. And when that happens, uh, it, it's important to try and stop it. I'm not against people saying, let's stop it. But there's something about the way people say, stop it, which is about trying to sort of just revert back to what they regard as normal. And what was normal led to Brexit and Trump. So we have to do better than that. We've got to work out why they have happened, um, not in a kind of abstract way, but in order, as far as I'm concerned, uh, to reverse Brexit. And I hope the Americans will uh, rid themselves of Trump and his influence. So there's a purpose to the argument of looking at these causes so that we can address what people's real concerns and... Um, that's what I've tried to do in the book. And in terms of the causes, I see the following. I argue that, first of all, there's a profound loss of trust in the, the state system as a whole, uh, both, you know, Labour and Conservative. Uh, and this goes back politically to the Iraq war, in my view. And not just that the British state lied, but also it had made a judgment that it could win in Iraq and it would be backing an American victory in Iraq. And we, those of us who protested, the street, the one and a half million who were in the record sizes, the enormous opposition, we were wiser, the unwashed were wiser than the elite. Um, and, and I think a lot of people who did support the war, including many from working class communities who provided the servicemen uh, who gave their lives and who went out there and risked their lives, um, they at least expected, they weren't, they weren't as shocked as if what you might say the middle class, the professional classes were at the deceit. Uh, they sort of expected that, but they thought that if the whole of the state, both political parties, the, the foreign office, the secret services, the army, the military, if they all agreed that they could do it, they could win, then they backed that. And when we lost the defeat in Basra, and in, 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 in Helmand in Afghanistan were very considerable defeats which had been covered over by the sense of withdrawal. I think there was a very profound sense that these states that people were proud of, uh, these imperial states, we, we were about winning. Trump makes his point very emphatically and that loss also generated. So there was a, a double loss of trust, political and military trust in the strategic position uh, of the two main Anglo-Saxon countries. Uh, and then that was then followed by the financial crash and a sense that, first of all, we were lied to, then we were lost, then uh, the whole economic system that we had been told, we trusted, crashed. And then they looted us with the quantitative easing so that in the decades since the financial crash, uh, the rich have got considerably richer, their banks have been saved, um, and a regular person's salaries have flatlined or gone down, and there's been an extraordinary increase uh, in insecurity and precarity. You see this in house prices, in debt. So there's a profound alienation from the, a, a dual system, dual party government of both Labour and Conservative. And one aspect of the Brexit vote was that finally people were asked the question, do you want us to carry on as we are? And very understandably, uh, if wrongly, people said no. 
they did not. And when I say wrongly, I mean that leaving the European Union is not the solution to the catastrophe of government that we have witnessed. Another reason for Brexit, which I didn't go on about much, but I emphasise quite strongly, is the nature of the European Union itself and its undemocratic character. Uh, and the, the arguments about that I regard as, as you know, completely justified. But uh, I would put it like this, that in my view, uh, what happens to our continent is what happens to us. If Europe goes neo-fascist or undemocratic, which it could do, we've just seen the elections in Austria, then this country will as well. If Europe is prosperous and democratic, this country can be as well. And that the fight for Europe is the fight for the nature of, of British society, and we can't separate ourselves from that. But without any doubt, one of the causes of Brexit was uh, the actual nature of the European Union. And another reason for Brexit that I argue about is that the, um, the left, not just the Labour Party, but the left as a whole, had no real convincing vision of what a democratic Europe should look like. There was no positive message about what an alternative Europe could really be, certainly not one that got communicated to the public. So all those were very profound and important reasons for Brexit, but there was an additional one, which if you like is the heart of the book so far as Brexit is concerned and this country is concerned. And you could dramatise it in this way. All these factors were true in Scotland, but Scotland voted to remain. All these factors were true in London. Economically, London has benefited, so not as true, but still the political ones was true. And London voted to remain. But they, the same factors led what I call England without London to vote by an 11% majority to leave. So I argue that these forces were, went through, if you like, the eye of the needle of a, an English nationalism. And it was a frustrated Englishness which drove Brexit. And one of the very striking things for me about this argument is that I lay it out, I look at the figures, the percentages are absolutely striking. Every region, every class of England without London, even when you include in that the other big cities that voted uh, uh, to remain in the European Union, everywhere there was a majority vote to leave. But no one will talk about this. You know, we, the, the BBC went off and interviewed, you know, working class guys in Newcastle with bad teeth and, and sort of blamed the, the quote, left behind as if they, you know, the, 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 the many, there were millions of voters, two to three million voters, who had given up on the system, and many of them, for example, the moving account of what happened in the black country, who were traditional Labour voters, had stopped voting and came out for the ballot. Uh, so that was an, a, a contributing cause, but they were by no means, uh, you know, you don't get to a 52% a vote, you don't get a 17.4 million by those. So it was, it was a predominantly a conservative and a southern and a vote of the, of the English relatively well off, but squeezed and very insecure and feeling very frustrated. So what are the causes of this English dissatisfaction? Why did England blame Europe? for uh, uh, its frustrations. And that question is one that I ask very emphatically, and it's striking to me, if I can say this, that in Ireland or in, uh, uh, in France uh, or now in New York, people are very interested in these answers. But the, with the exception of a review in The New Statesman, um, the British newspapers and Open Democracy, which I've, I, I helped to found and which has been covering the, the issues and I which I write in regularly, they don't want to know. They, they, it's like saying you say, look, the car's bust and they say, yeah, let's get it moving, we'll push. And I say, well, why didn't you open the bonnet? And they say, well, we do not want to open the bonnet. Um, and I've opened the bonnet. Now, what do we see there if we open the bonnet? Well, now, it is odd to say that this is an English vote because, you know, the English want Britain. They want this to be Great Britain. They want global Britain. They, they're not asking for an English parliament, another layer of government. Um, 
but a number of studies have shown that um, the you know they did there was one survey which I thought was really striking and illustrative of this which went and asked people what do you think is the layer of government that has the most influence over your lives and remote areas of Europe like Galicia would say 9% might say the European Union in Wales it was 6% uh, in Scotland it was 4% and in England it was 30% now the European Union is quite influential but it's not the most influential layer of government. So 30% of the English are completely wrong in thinking that the European Union is the thing that is governing their lives more than anything else. And the people that did the survey thought perfectly reasonably, it seems to me, that the reason why the English thought that, obviously in a rather hostile way, is that they have no government of their own that speaks for England. And it's very striking this. The, uh, England is a historic country, a proud country, one with a lot of self-consciousness. A majority of the people that live in England when asked now describe themselves as English rather than British. Yet not only is there not a single institution that represents them that says we are, you know, there's an English health service, there's English heritage, there's enormous sums of money, there's an, a lot of cultural capital, if you want to call it that, at stake. There's not a single institution of a representative kind whose role is to represent the interests of England. Nor is there a single think tank whose aim is to look at English interests. Uh, and when you say, well, look, you know, there's there's a Scottish TUC and then there is a British TUC. There is a, there's a Church of Scotland and there's the Church of England, but the Church of England, you know, ha, it, it, it's a world church. It's looking after Anglicanism around the world. So that there is a British broadcasting company and there is a Scottish broadcast BBC and there's a Welsh BBC and there's a Northern Irish BBC, but there's not an English BBC. So England is, is has uh, no way of expressing itself. and. One of the reasons why for this, I argue, is that England expresses itself in what I call Anglo-Britishness. It, it assumes the right to rule Scotland and Wales and, it, and that, uh, uh, that Britishness is constitutionally incompatible with membership of the European Union. And this allowed the English to blame Europe for their ills, when their ills are really centred, the source of their ills is centred on Westminster.